Now to our daily arts and culture section, and I'm joined by a man who has a background in anthropology and a passion for political and social change. But my final guest this morning has chosen to express these passions through his art. David Birkin is hosting an exhibit in London called Mouths at the Invisible Event. It's his first solo exhibition, and it brings together a diverse series of work around the themes of censorship, surveillance, and war. David, thanks for coming in. Censorship, surveillance, and war. Tell us, tell us more. Those are broad themes. What what exactly are you doing with them? Um, well, I, I'm looking at a lot of the issues that have come to the fore since September 11th, um, and particularly the way that war, the changes in the way that war is fought. Um, so some of those issues are the way that civilian casualties are counted, some of them are the way that the legal structures have changed, the language of war, and how it's kind of shifted and allowed um, the theatre of war, as it's called, to kind of been extended indefinitely, whether it's geographically or temporarily. And by the theatre of war, do you mean how it's portrayed within the media, using pictures in certain but, ways, and how they build a narrative and a story? Yeah, that's definitely part of it. The war of images is part of it, but also the legal structures. For example, I mean, the United States hasn't declared war what, since um, 1942, um, and of the, you know, 20 plus wars that they've been involved in, um, only a handful of them were even sanctioned by Congress. So this idea of going to war, declaring war, the, old, the traditional idea of what a war constitutes has shifted so dramatically, and then obviously with, with things like the drone program, it's become you know, it's, we've, we've reached a point where we're basically at war indefinitely in any country that the United States or any particular government feels that they have a target that they are, um, you know, that they can justify pursuing. And what kind of images are you, we've got, we've got a wall behind you of some of the stuff that you've been mm, doing, but what yeah. kind of things do you pick up on to sort of illustrate your views on these things? So these iguana images that you see here, um, they're actually, they're not by me, um, I can't draw. Um, they're commissioned by a lady called Janet Hamlin, um, who was the military appointed uh, courtroom sketch artist at the Guantanamo tribunals. So um, at, Gu at the tribunals, you're not allowed to bring cameras into the courtroom. Um, so they have a, a, a courtroom sketch artist. Um, and I contacted her and I asked her if she'd like to um, collaborate on a project. And the reason I chose the iguanas was because back in 2003, there was an attorney called Tom Wilner who was trying to persuade the Supreme Court to hear the case of a group of detainees, Kuwaiti detainees, who are being held without charge or trial. And the Supreme Court was saying, no, Guantanamo is not US soil. We have no jurisdiction over Guantanamo. And they refused to hear the case. And so what he did was very cleverly say, well, look, there's this there's a species of iguana called Cyclura nubila, is the, the, the Latin name, um, the Cuban rock iguana, and they're protected under the 1973 US Endangered Species Act. And whenever one of these reptiles crosses the perimeter fence into the naval base at Guantanamo, it becomes subject to US law. And any soldier who runs one over with a jeep is subject is liable to a fine of up to $1,000. Um, so if you extend jurisdiction to the iguanas, not the detainees, then you're effectively affording more rights to lizards than people. And on the basis of that, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. So I just asked her to draw them in the same, in the same style, on the same legal paper, with the same pastels, as she would normally draw, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or the chief prosecutor or any of the other figures at the tribunals. It's a very interesting and creative way of making a point, isn't it? I mean, do you, have, do you take a, a stance on issues, obviously, in this exhibit? Do you, do you make it clear your feelings about war or is it more uh, general and vague than that? I do. I mean, I, I, I do take. I, I do have a position, and I've never been um, allergic to. I, I don't feel that um, you know. There's this Orwell quote that, that the opinion that um, art should not be political is in itself a political opinion, and I think it's quite nefarious when you see people trying to depoliticize art and the work of artists. I mean, artists going back to you know uh, Goya and Guernica, Picasso's Guernica has always had a political. You know, politics has been very important for artists historically. Um, at the same time, I don't want to ram it down people's throats, and I think that it's more important to raise certain questions and open up a space for thinking about these issues and let people make their own minds up than telling them what I think. And you are based, I gather, maybe in New York, I'm or you based have in been New York, further yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, and you've travelled a lot between New York, London, and various other yeah. places. What yeah. has your location meant in terms of how you've been influenced? Does your location play a part? Is the fact that New York... 9-11, yeah. did that really filter into what you did? I think it did have, I mean, I'm actually half American, half British. My mother's American, and so I grew up there when I was very young, and it's, you know, when military actions um, have taken place in the name of the British people or the American people, you know, I have sent, I have felt a certain kind of, I don't know if responsibility is too, too strong a word, but certainly, you know, in my name, not in my name. Um, I think America certainly 
when a lot of the work is relating to the post 9-11 political landscape, I think it's New York is, um, uh, you know, it's an important place to be. And certainly for things like the skywriting performance that I did and the, um, the I, I did a piece with a, a, an aeroplane going around the Statue of Liberty. I mean, these are iconic landmarks in the, on the New York skyline. And to be able to do these kind of large scale public performances is something which is a lot, it's a lot easier to do out there than it is in, in Britain. Do you think uh, governments and armies and um, people who are caught up in wars have become mm. more so sophisticated over the years at um, portraying a story through the use of images and almost through art at trying to set a narrative as to what's going on. Uh, do you think that that's mm. something that is in a way sinister but also in a way quite clever in a form of art itself? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about kind of the war on images, I think there was a big shift post-Vietnam. Um, the US government realized the fallout from, you know, public opinion going against the war. Um, in those days, journalists were free to go and take photographs. Um, now what you see is the, the policy of embedding, where journalists are kind of, you know, caught, basically given, a, given access by being allowed to ride into a tank, for example, during the invasion. Um, but as a result, you get a very specific kind of story coming out of those places, which is always kind of from the military's perspective. And I think that, um, I mean, one of the pieces that I made um, related to an executive order that went back to George Bush Sr., George H. H.W. Bush um, banning journalists from publishing photographs of the flag draped coffins of American soldiers being repatriated from Iraq. And that ban, that executive order, was reinstated by his son, George W. Bush, and finally repealed by the Obama administration. And it was just a classic example in the post-Vietnam post of the government trying to control the kinds of images that went into the media and saying, we're not going to make that mistake again. We're not going to let the American public see all these coffins coming back of, of our fallen soldiers. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is very, you know, and, and the sky writing in terms of um, in terms of being very savvy in terms of the way that um, uh, government governments and, and and agencies use social media I mean the sky writing piece that I did was a classic example it was a quote from a rejection letter that the CIA had sent to the American Civil Liberties Union denying their Freedom of Information Act requests for records relating to the drone program and what they did was they gave them this very standardized what's called the Glomar response which basically says the CIA can neither confirm nor deny the existence of or non-existence of any records responsive to your request. And so I just took the words existence or non-existence and I had them written in the New York skyline. Um, five days later, I mean, this went semi-viral on, on Twitter that week. Five days later, the CIA joined Twitter with their inaugural tweet. We can neither confirm nor deny that this is our first tweet. Do you think that was influenced by your... Because by your, that's amazing, because I, that actually happened. You, you think that might have been photoshopped, but... I kind of think that if you're a government spy agency and you're thinking of joining Twitter that week and you're not looking at what's trending, you're probably not doing your job properly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is your first solo exhibition. What do you hope um, will, will come out of it? What are your aims and why did you choose London to do it? Um, well, I was invited to do it by the Mosaic Rooms, which is a, a, a public gallery, a non-profit gallery that I've admired um, for some time. Um, they do a lot of work relating to the Middle East. Um, I don't know what I hope to come out of it specifically. Um, I probably don't work that way. Um, I'm just make, you know, I've made a body of work, part of which I made during a residency um, with the Whitney Independent Study Program in, in New York. And this was a chance to show it. I'd already shown it in New York for that. Um, and this was a chance to show it uh, in Britain, which is, you know, my, my, the, the country that I was born in. Absolutely. And uh, just uh, for people who are watching, when, when can they go and see it? Where are the Mosaic Rooms? The Mosaic Rooms are on the Cromwell Road in London. Um, and the show runs until the 28th of February. And we have a, um, a series of screenings and talks, um, which will be on their website. Um, documentaries, for example, of the drone program. Perfect. And going forward, um, it, more of the same can we expect from you? Are you going to stick with the same kind of um, themes that you've got here, or, or broader speaking, what are you thinking in the future? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. There you go. <laughs> Leave the audience wanting yeah. more. Thank you very much, Thank indeed, you very much David, for, having me. for coming in. Just to, uh, just to re-emphasize that, that uh, you can go and see uh, David's exhibition uh, in the Mosaic Rooms in London. That's on until the 28th of February, am I right? Lindsay? That's right, yes. 28th of February, yeah. um, and it's called Mouths at the Invisible Event. Thank you very much indeed for Thank coming you. in. Best of luck. Thank you very all. much.